forgive error anything. A couple of housekeeping points. Phones off or on silent, please, unless you happen to have yours Bluetooth to your hearing aids like I do. And since I'm the only one here with a program, let me just advise you that after my few words and the ambassadors, we'll have uh, an interview of Father David Harold Barry by Dr. David Kaulemu for about 15 minutes, after which we'll move through for refreshments and uh, networking. It's become a cliche to say that Ireland punches above its weight, but like many a cliche, it holds much truth especially in the realm of culture and the book. Consider the legendary Abbey Theatre. Consider Tour Balili. Consider the heavenly plangent music of the Ilian Pipes. Consider the receipt of more Nobel Literature Prizes per head than any other country in the world, apart from St. Lucia, the isolated example. And so we're delighted that Her Excellency Fanula Gilsonen has flown in from her Pretoria base to bring us together this evening. Her bailiwick covers not only South Africa and Zimbabwe, but also Mauritius, Lesotho and Botswana. A dream job by any reckoning, but a high mileage one too, making her presence here a privilege for us, as well as an enormous pleasure. I like to think that but for the wretched COVID, we'd have seen more of her over the last few years than we have. Let's hope that changes in the future. All of that said, the question remains, what the hell's this book got to do with the Irish? The author, that's what, your man, Father David, whom we'll hear interviewed shortly, is a native of the Isle, and for a place of such fiercely felt and justifiable pride, that's more than enough. And that's more than enough from me, Ambassador. The podium is yours. Murray, thank you very much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm really delighted to be here today and uh, you know, to welcome you to, to the launch of uh, Father David Harold Barry's um, latest book, uh, and I say his latest book because, of course, he is someone who has written a lot over the years. So it's really nice to have the opportunity to host an event that launches uh, this important history of, of the Jesuits in Zimbabwe and, you know, celebrates an important contribution to history generally, I think, in Zimbabwe. It's also for us as the Embassy of Ireland a really nice opportunity to recognise Father David as, as an author and somebody who himself has made an immense contribution to life in Zimbabwe over the last 55 years. I have, um, you'll be glad to know, I've read the book. Um, I admit it to Murray, not cover to cover, but pretty in intensely at least uh, for the first half and then a bit of speed reading to get through the whole thing before we met this evening. Um, and I have to say that I've only met Father, uh, Father Harold Barry uh, once. We had tea um, in, in his house. And I really thought that his approach to writing the history was really in keeping with his character. Um, and I'd also like to think that it was influenced um, by lessons from his homeland's history. Um, in Ireland, I think we've come to the conclusion that there are no mythical histories, only honest, messy renditions of how we humans live our lives, with all its contradictions, disappointments, and moments of courage and heroism. And the title of the book, A Mission Divided, provides a clue to the critical nature of the way he approached the work. It sets out, in a sense, to explore the dualities of the church, the institution that thrived on conservatism in tension with individuals within those institutions who strive to be the prophetic voices of their time. A book which records only the heroic struggles of the Jesuits in this country might deserve a shorter shelf life. This book should be read precisely because it engages with more difficult truths that need to be confronted. In tracing this history, the book highlights the complexity of the religious mission's work in colonial and post-colonial Zimbabwe. Father David charts the beginning of the Jesuit missions as closely intertwined with the scramble for Africa and its evolution in Zimbabwe as being inherently interlinked with the colonial period. 
As the colonial state evolved, it found an ally in the institution of the church and often the, off the opportunity to be a voice against racism, oppression and injustice was missed. And perhaps more shamefully, the church itself espoused apartheid policies in its, dealing with, in its dealings with the majority black population. And critical engagement with this history is important but it, because it calls on us today to question if we sit now on the side of justice and rights or if we take an easier path of collusion and co-option by the institu institutions of the present. So while this book doesn't gloss over the moral failures of the Jesuits, the church or society, neither does it ignore the spirit of those people intent on building a better world. The book explores the duality of the church and the people who live within it, presenting to us everyday heroes who make up the missionary movement. And these are people who've dedicated their entire lives, and in some cases gave their lives, for the cause of bringing education, health, or a better life to their fellow humans. I'm reminded of Margaret Mead, who said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. So this book also makes an important contribution to understanding Zimbabwean history, particularly the liberation period, where the church and the Jesuits operating out of Silverin House played an immensely important role in witnessing and recording the human rights violations and crimes committed by the Rhodesian government of the time. The role proved critical in bringing, bringing international attention to the liberation struggle and encountering the effective propaganda of the Ian Smith government. The Catholic Commission for Justice and Peace benefited, benefited greatly from the courage and tenacity of many Jesuits, including Father Fidelis uh, Mukunori. Without their witness, the suffering, the dispossession and the loss of life by many would have gone undocumented during this period. So the book highlights many such contributions and provides inspiration for the next generation of Jesuits currently being tra trained in Zimbabwe and indeed in the region. And Father David himself has been a consistent and prolific voice highlighting the injustice and inequality that so many Zimbabweans continue to suffer. He's worked with prisoners, people with intellectual disabilities, and many other people whose voices struggle to be heard. His writings, including his column in the Zimbabwean and his num numerous books, have made an immense contribution to civic and academic life in Zimbabwe. Over the years, his work has touched upon a wide range of subjects, including the struggle for human rights and justice, the nature of power, and what it means to be a good citizen. One of the nicest things, and I say this often, about being an Irish ambassador to Zimbabwe and indeed to the region, is the number of meetings I've had which start with the story about the crucial role an Irish missionary has played in improving the life of, of a particular person. I've met countless Zimbabweans, from government ministers to lawyers to academics to teachers and to business people, who credit an Irish missionary with having helped them along in their path to life. And of course, it wasn't just Irish missionaries, but we're here this evening to celebrate an Irish missionary, and thus I give them uh, most emphasis. Um, for us, I suppose, as the Irish Embassy, because people have asked me here this evening, oh, why is the Irish Embassy involved? And it's an opportunity for us, really, to pay tribute and to recognise that really important contribution and legacy of the Irish missionaries, because it's part now of how people in Zimbabwe think about Ireland. And for that, we're immensely grateful because it's such a positive contribution. So it's really, from, in, in my sense, uh, from my point of view, really important to be here to, to mark this occasion and to celebrate, uh, to celebrate Irish missionaries and to celebrate Father David Harold Barry who epitomises really the best of what Irish missionaries had to offer. Always striving to help, always striving to learn, and always striving to do better for those who need it most. So I'm really looking forward to the interview uh, this evening. And just before I remove myself from the podium, I just want to really thank Weaver Press for this book launch this evening, and also for our 
technical guys here, you can see them. And um, they've just, I think, put together a lovely setup uh, this evening. And uh, I think, Murray, you were saying it looked like a Channel 4 studio. So I think we're in for a really uh, lovely treat this evening, wonderful interview. And we're also recording it for posterity. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Ambassador. It's not every day that we join posterity. Thanks too to your colleagues, Vicky Dillon and Godwin Chitza, to quid pro quo for their provision and mastery of matters technical. Maybe not Channel 4, but maybe it looks like Stephen Sacker and Hard Talk. I hope you're prepared for <laughs> tough questioning. Thanks also to uh, Raphael Chukukwa and Fadzai Muchemwa at the National Gallery of Zimbabwe for kindly hosting us this evening. And I'll just mention something that Raphael told me when we were chatting outside earlier, that uh, staff of the gallery and artists from Zimbabwe recently returned from the Venice Biennale, where out of well over 100 national exhibits, Zim the Zimbabwean pavilion was scored number seven. Not the sort of thing we hear much about, but well done. <laughs> I'm now delighted to hand the conversation baton to the two Davids, both of them good friends of Weaver Press. Fanula's stolen some of my thunder by telling you all about David Harold Barry, but that won't stop me saying a few words about him. And maybe you'd be prepared, gentlemen, when you come to speak, you have to press a little button on the right-hand side of your microphone. Yeah. David Kaulemu is the Dean of the School of Education and Leadership and director of the Center for Ethics at Arupi Jesuit University here in Harare, a fine institution. He's formerly a lecturer at the University of Zimbabwe and currently teaches social, economic, and environmental philosophy. He's the author of several books, Ending Violence in Zimbabwe, and editor of the Political Participation in Zimbabwe and Imagining Citizenship in Zimbabwe. And his research interests include ethics, social justice, conflict and social transformation, and Christian social teaching. David Harold Barry, as everybody knows now, is a Jesuit priest from Ireland. He spent 55 years in this country, was for 25 years at Silvera House, where he had ample opportunity to witness the frustration of people, both before and after independence. The reasons were different, but the underlying structures that caused them were the same. Besides writing a column for the Zimbabwean newspaper and writing two books, one about Jesuits killed in the war and the other a collection of essays on the situation in Zimbabwe at the turn of the century, he's been engaged in training young Jesuits, working in prisons, and starting a community of lash for people living with intellectual disabilities. David, and David, you have about 15, 20 minutes. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, David. Congratulations for this uh, If I didn't think it is worth reading and promoting, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> so how do you feel? I mean, you have quite a number of Jesuits here, old and young, accompanying you in this journey. How do you feel now? Uh, how do I feel? I, I just, about the book, about publishing the book and... How do I feel about it? Yes. Oh, well, I... Oh, wait a minute, I've got to turn this on. Another <laughs> one, good. You sure? Can you tell me this one? Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's working. Oh. I think it's okay. Yeah. Yes, that one. Is that one working? Yeah. yeah. Is it working? Can you hear me? Um, no, I'm, I'm very, very delighted that this, uh, this little project uh, was finally come to an end, or I mean, that it finally saw the light of day. Um, and believe it or not, it's one of the good things resulting from COVID, because two years ago, when COVID descended on us like a black cloud, I said to myself, what am I going to do now? And then I, I felt that I had no excuse but to um, obey 
you know, Jesuits are very good at obeying, obeying the uh, request of our provincial father, Chiazza Chimanda, to write the story of the Jesuits in Zimbabwe because um, last year uh, we joined up with the Zambian, Mozambican, South African, and Malawian Jesuits into one very large unit. And so the sort of maybe the particular history of Zimbabwe could get lost. So anyway, it was an opportunity to do that. And um, so I'm very happy uh, to have been able to do what I did. Um, I, I don't know whether I can say a word. I, I, I may forget if I don't say it now. But I'm really grateful <laughs> to, uh, to two, uh, first of all, to Weaver Press, who um, quite demanding, you know, they're very demanding. You think you've done a good job, and then suddenly, no, this won't do. And you've got to go back again and do it again. So they were really quite demanding. And I think whatever credit, uh, in terms of the presentation, you have to give a, a big thank you to uh, Irene Staunton and um, Murray McCartney. <clears throat> and then, of course, being, de you know, it's amazing. Uh, ju just the sort of suddenly being discovered as an Irishman. I mean, I haven't been kind of thinking of myself all that much uh, because there are other things uppermost in my mind. But suddenly this, this kind of Irish thing came to the fore. And I'm very happy about that. I'm very kind of proud of that. And when you see, oh, it's gone. But there was a, there was a harp, which is the national symbol of Ireland, on, on here. And that kind of thing warms our heart because it's, uh, it goes way back to the Middle Ages when people played the harp in the, in, the, um, in the big halls where the people gathered and so on. So anyway, I'd just like to say a big thank you to the Irish Embassy, to Finula and Vicky for all their work and for welcoming to this. Now, I've probably forgotten your question, but basically... Uh, uh, huh? I'll ask another one. Okay. Yes. Right. So, you spent 55 years in Zimbabwe, mm. and um, you spent less than that in Ireland, but you see yourself as Irish. I will ask this question because of the nature of mission. Um, I think it's a courageous book that you have written. You confront very serious and powerful demons about prejudice, about ignorance, arrogance, and naivety, even of your own fellow Jesuits. I'm not sure that you will win the battle against these demons. Do you think you will win? Well, um, thank you for that. Uh, basically, when I started writing this, and oh gosh, I pressed something. Um, is that right? Yeah. yeah. When I started writing this uh, book, I really thought it would be a kind of descriptive book with little, little odd stories and so on. But as I got into it, I began to realize there were big issues here. Um, and uh, you've already highlighted the very early Jesuits who came up by Oxwagon in the 1880s. They were inevitably uh, contaminated by the culture of, uh, they were not yet colonials, but the basic white attitudes in South Africa about Africans and so on. And I highlight in the book the word degradation. And it's, it's a horrible word, but it basically, people used it left, right, and center, and even Jesuits used it <clears throat> to describe people and to describe the way in which Lobengula uh, governed his uh, kingdom. And, 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 and so you, you begin to realize that, that um, uh, our Jesuits were somehow influenced by all of this, this kind of culture. And then I, I, you go on to the post-colonial, or the colonial period, where um, the Jesuits were quite happy to have the infrastructure of the railways, the uh, communication systems, the law and order, and so on. They could move about freely, and they 
they cozied up to the colonial powers. They were uh, in and out of, um, out of government offices and so on. And even our dear Bishop, Archbishop Chichester was on very good terms with the uh, administration at that time, a bit, a bit later. But my, my feeling was, and of course this is so easy to say after all these years, but my feeling was, why did we not notice what was going on in the 1920s when segregation was, was being extended and um, being used, land issues, even um, a worker, a worker was defined as a European. You couldn't, workers were allowed to form trade unions, but then you have to say, what is a worker? Well, it's not an African. They weren't allowed. And so you, you have all this kind of stuff going on, and you, you become aware that we were simply silent. We didn't challenge it in the 1920s, 1930s. And, and that's something that sort of really pained me as I went through the book. Now, I know it's easy to um, judge after the situation was quite different and difficult and so on, but really, um, I just wonder why we had people like Arthur Shirley Cripps uh, of the Anglican Church, we had um, John White of the Methodist Church. They were protesting vigorously, but the Catholics were quiet. So this is something, we've just got to admit it, but I mean, we, one can kind of understand it in a way that the Catholic Church was on the defensive ever since the 19th century when um, they were being th driven out of country after country and they felt they better behave themselves if they're going to make uh, progress. So, but there are all these kind of things going on. So um, my feeling was that uh, although it's easy to say it, we missed the boat. In the 1920s and in the 1930s, we could have challenged, we had enough kind of influence to challenge the authorities, but we didn't do it. And by the 1960s, it was too late, you know? And my big example of that, I mean, I, 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 I hope it's not too simplistic, but let me say it anyway. My big example of that is we were quite happy to have African people going to the seminary to study to become priests in the 1930s, but we couldn't admit them to St. George's which was still a white-only school. Now, I know there were reasons. I know there were, <laughs> there were all sorts of reasons. But when you look at the bare facts, uh, you, you say to yourself, how is it, how is it that we missed that kind of opportunity to uh, make a stance? It could have been very messy. St. George's might have been closed for a while or something might have happened. But we just didn't do it. And so we kind of went along with everything until it was too late. That painful realization runs through your book. And I think um, you have. You never lose sight of the humanity of the characters that you are writing about. Whether you're talking about the white conquerors, as you put them or the ambitious white missionaries, or the shrewd local chiefs and kings who were playing around games and so on, even including uh, those people who killed some of your Jesuit um, brothers. You continue to see them as human. You present them as human beings, as uh, making human decisions and even human mistakes. Yeah, no, that's true. Thank you for that. And I think people, I mean, the work they did, the conditions under which they lived, and I mean, you know, uh, traveling by foot around the country, maybe with donkeys, bringing them and so on. And there are various stories that one, one can tell about that. But basically, it was really, because the fact these people were heroic, really were heroic. And when you, I mean, from the, from the Christian point of view, the fact that Augustus Law died in um, Zila's place in what is now uh, 
Shangan territory on the borders of Mozambique. He died there alone. Well, he had Brother Headley with him, but they had nothing, no medicines, no food that they could eat, racked by malaria, and he just dies. I mean, he's only, he's only in the country just over a year. Uh, oh, no, more than that. But anyway, <coughs> 18 months. But uh, the Jesuits sort of keep sort of saying on the one hand, this is a disaster. The whole period from 1879 to 1889 was a disaster. On the other hand, from their faith, <laughs> from their faith as Christian people, they knew that they were somehow uh, planting seeds that would later uh, mature. And so I think um, the, the phrase I quote about Augustus Law in Zealous when he says, I couldn't despair even if I tried. I couldn't despair even if I tried. A sort of a sense of even though he's dying, he's finished, he's, everything's collapsed around him, still he has that kind of long-term faith that uh, something is going to come out of the, the ashes of this early period. So um, people will want to know, what is this divided mission? Can you explain? What divided the mission? Yeah, the, the, the mission divided. Well, I, I, uh, yes, the, 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 title, <laughs> the title went through about five different uh, variations. But anyway, this one, um, basically the idea is there was a mission. There was, everybody was clear, Father General in Rome, the Jesuits, and so on. We all knew there was a mission, a mission to go into the interior of Africa, preach the gospel, try to improve the lives of the people with schools, um, hospitals, and so on. That was the mission, and it was clear. But as time went on, we ended up having one mission for the whites and another mission for the blacks. And it got, uh, in the early days, it wasn't so pronounced and it wasn't a real problem. But as time went on, it became a tense kind of thing. Um, I don't want to exaggerate it. I don't want to, you know, uh, there are people in this audience who are from St. George's or who've de dedicated the best years of their life to St. George's. So I don't want to, I'm not criticizing anybody. I'm just simply saying that we missed an opportunity uh, to, um, uh, um, to sort of make a mark. Now, there's one person here who kindly introduced himself at the beginning, James Mushore, and he was a little boy at St. George's in the 1960s, and he very kindly shared with me some of his experiences. And really, you just, you just put your head in your hands and say, how is it possible? How is it possible that <laughs> people can be so blind as to treat people so differently in one way or another? Um, there's an even more extraordinary story about um, um, is, uh, um, the other man, oh gosh, my head, but there was somebody who came earlier than James, Titus Munyaradzi, he came in 1964, and they sent one young African boy on his own. Why didn't they send 10 or, or at least five to kind of be companions to one another? <laughs> they sent just one. <laughs> you can imagine uh, the wolves descending on the poor guy. Anyway, he survived. Um, uh, yeah. um, in setting up the scene for the book, you suggest there are at least two ways of initi initiating developing and running a mission. You said that you can approach it as a gardener or as a mechanic. Oh, yeah, yeah. Can you explain I, I that? Like, I like that, uh, that uh, a little um, um, saying of George Keenan, who was the American um, ambassador to Moscow just after the war. And uh, the Americans were very alarmed by the buildup of, of armaments, the Russians, and they were going to, there was a fear the Russians would take over Eastern Europe uh, and even Western Europe. 
and Keenan wrote back and to Washington and said, look, don't make a big fuss about this. Just develop your own strength and do nothing. Let them know that you're strong. And then gradually they will begin to think. And that's exactly what happened. The, the, the USSR, the Soviets, um, went so far and no further. They got as far as they got in about 1948, and then for the next 40 years, they did, they did nothing in terms of expansion. So Keenan was right, but it, the images of a gardener who just allows things to happen in their natural way, whereas a mechanic comes in and wants to fix things. Now this is precisely, I shouldn't get into politics, but this is precisely what Putin, 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 what's his name? Putin is, is doing in Ukraine. He's trying to fix things like a mechanic. He's not allowing people to make their own decisions and come to some kind of... Maybe he has some grounds for what he's doing, I don't know, but certainly has no grounds for the methods he's using. And uh, so the image of the gardener and the mechanic means a lot to me. I think it's, 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 a, it's a beautiful image. I'm nothing against mechanics. They have to fix things. <laughs> but it's just the image of allowing the, the um, dynamic to sort of unfold in its own way, I think is good. As you were saying in the book that uh, the Jesuits on the whole were working more like mechanics than as gardeners who could cultivate the local culture, enculturate it, and be part and parcel of their faith. Is that what you say? Yeah, I'm afraid there's a lot of truth in that. I think there's a lot of truth in that. We didn't, you see, this whole idea of enculturation was there in our history of the church from the 17th century because Matteo Ricci, when he went to China, realized that the Chinese had a magnificent civilization of their own going back hundreds if not thousands of years and he said if we are going to succeed in China and same in India we have to not bring in our sort of thing but try to find entry points into the local culture and Matteo Ricci was terribly successful. Uh, it took, it took about a hundred years for Rome to wake up and realize what he was doing, and then, of course, they went to the kind of default position of suppressing what he was doing, because, that, well, I'm afraid Rome does that from time to time. They kind of suppress something good, not meaning to suppress something good, but just because somehow it's different from what we're used to, and we don't like things to be different. So the... the uh, the Chinese rights collapsed, and they were only reinstated in 1949, which was far, far, far too late. Now, in Zimbabwe, we never even tried to um, learn the culture. I'm afraid we were, we were contaminated by the dominant attitude of whites and other missionaries, not just us, who just basically said, the Africans don't have any culture. You know, they don't have a belief in God. All this stuff, you can't believe it, but that's, these are the things they were saying. And uh, even some of our wonderful missionaries had a very low opinion of the, um, the culture and beliefs and, and so on of the local people. So it's very sad, but there you are. So my point really, uh, David, is that I'm not here to judge the past. But what I would like to do is to make us alert about the present because there may well be very important things that we're just not noticing in the present situation and we're not doing anything about it. And maybe we have an opportunity to do something about it, but we're not doing it because it doesn't fit into our job description or something. I want to locate... All right, I, I want to locate your book um, in the context of other books that have been written and you have commented on them. Um, I wanted you to comment on your uh, rendition of uh, the Mukonori's book, 
in the, the man in the middle where he is talking about the massacre of the seven mis uh, missionaries uh, in Musami. Um, he has a certain way of interpreting who was responsible and you caught him quite extensively but you are skeptical about his conclusion. Well, I've, you're right. I did talk to him, and I allowed myself to be persuaded by him, but then I kept meeting other people who said, look, you say that about Musami, but there is another... Po What's wrong? Oh, sorry. I, I was told to keep turning it off and on, but it's a bit... Uh, anyway. I'm not a mechanic. Ah. <coughs> but um, uh, Mukunori, I, I do take his, his view of the, I do mention his view of the Musami, who was responsible for the Musami killings. And the whole complex thing about Father Dunstan Myersko, who wasn't killed. And all the others were riddled with bullets, but he didn't have a single bullet in him. And, you know, there's simply no answers. There just don't seem to be answers. If there are people alive today who know what really happened on that night, I just hope they will really tell us uh, before they die, because really there is no consensus about who was responsible for Musami and who was responsible for the killings in Matabililand with uh, Bishop, what's his name, and so on. There are, there, are, there are some where it's fairly clear who, who did it, but there are others where it's, um, people are just simply divided on, um, on... I just want to ask you one final question. Uh, is indicating that um, uh, because I would have wanted to engage with your interpretation of Sister Janice, who I respect very much, and I know you respect her as well, I would have liked to see how you read her book and how you interpreted um, you know, what's, what was happening in the rural areas especially. Uh, but I mean, people will read for themselves what you have written. I also wanted to ask you about uh, Ian Linden's idea of the two churches. Ian Linden, uh, the, the two churches, the institutional church and the church of uh, but, I mean, people will read for themselves. My, my real question, uh, my last question is about what do you think the future uh, of the Jesuits? Not well, just in Zimbabwe, but maybe in the whole region here. Well, I mean, there are many of our young people here this evening, and uh, I'm really uh, full of uh, joy and hope because they're, they're thinking people, they're, they, they think. You know, um, T.S. Eliot used to say, there's very few people who think these days. Uh, but I think uh, our young people do think, and I hope that they will uh, come up with some kind of response, even if it's costly to them in the present situation. Because really, our situation is really, it's really painful. I mean, I came out here in 65, 66, and we've never had normality since I landed in Salisbury Airport in 1960. We've never had normality. We just haven't had a normal society where uh, things work and, and people are catered for and there's a sort of civic consciousness and the, the, the law is available to other people, the health service and so on. There have been good and bad times, but basically here we are, 40 whatever, years later, and really, I mean, it's terrible when you think. I mean, people keep coming to our house and say, please, Father, can you help me? I need to pay for a, a, a scan, or I need to do this. And there's just, you can't, you can't help these people. There's too many of them coming and so on. So, with Janus, I, I think there's something about Janus that um, you either love her or hate her, but I think she was Wonderful. I remember her saying at one point in her book um, that if she was going to an event 
she would agonize over what to wear at that event. But if she was asked to go to Rhodesia and join the Justice and Peace Commission and be put into prison and deported and so on, she just didn't hesitate. She just went for it. She was an extraordinarily generous person who, who uh, just, just grabbed the opportunities that came up, whether it was Kenya, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and so on. And um, I, I just feel she, she's very admirable from that point of view. Thank you very much. You will will try and steal the show, won't you, David? I'd like to thank you both very much. David Kay for um, eliciting interesting responses from this man, and to this man for leaving sufficient gaps that you will have to read the book now. We'll now break, we'll move outside, and there'll be an opportunity to have a book signed, to have a glass of wine, some snacks, and chat. Thank you all very much for coming. It's